unless he's leading a double life, like your caped crusader here. Batman The Long Halloween, part one. So before we start, let me just be honest with y'all. This movie is an adaptation of a well-known and seemingly legendary Batman tale. And it's one that I've pretty much only skimmed through. Never sat down and read it in full. I, I own it. It's on my shelf. I'll get to it. Eventually. But being that the movie is recent and just came out and I sat through it already on multiple occasions, I'm gonna start here. Let's just, let's just, let's just get right into it. I truly appreciate the blueprint of this story. I love a good Detective Batman arc, because despite being labeled as the world's greatest detective, a whole lot of writers seem to forget that he is one. Guy just shows up ready to throw hands and batarangs whenever. But what I love about this is that the movie shows Batman think things out. We see his premeditated actions as opposed to his impulsive reactions, though there's plenty of that too. If you're into brutal Batman, don't worry, this movie still got you covered. While there's plenty of kick-punchy action, The Long Halloween also makes a point to not just showcase the guy as Bruce the Barbarian, we see Batman's thirst for justice, not just in his hatred for criminals, but also with his compassion for others. I can confidently say the movie has been one of my all-time favorite depictions of The Dark Knight. I also happen to think the detective format works out really well for Batman. A great who did it story goes a long way when you throw some rubber bat ears on it. These kind of stories are personally my favorite scenarios to see the Caped Crusader in. These stories highlight Batman's superior intellect and problem solving skills, and they're still usually filled with Batman bam, pow, and socking a couple of thugs along the way. You know, on second thought, that last sentence could probably have been better structured, but you get the point. Or at least I hope you do. What helps matters is that we're seeing a much younger, less experienced, maybe even somewhat green version of the not-so-superhero. As a matter of fact, multiple characters throughout the movie's runtime even go out of their way to comment on how Batman isn't such a great detective. This now allows him to be much more convincing in his confused protagonist role. It also gives those who oppose Gotham City's protector a bit more of a chance of either getting away with their wrongdoings or at least getting away from Batman. The movie isn't just a Batman movie, but it's also in equal parts a Two-Face story. And being that Two-Face is my favorite villain, obviously it scored some points with me there too. But like I said before, I'm not super familiar with this comic. I have seen panels, I have read through it a little bit lightly, but I haven't sat down and really properly read it through. I, I don't have the full picture of the graphic novel. And even with my brief knowledge and memory of the original Long Halloween comic series, I still recognize that this DC animated movie did what a lot of DC animated movies do and changed a whole lot. So again, I don't have the greatest knowledge on the subject, but from what I recall, and feel free to call me out if I'm wrong, here are some of the changes that I noticed. In the movie, it's Harvey who winds up hospital bound but in the comics, it's his wife. This is a clever little twist that I think serves to alert those who have read the comic that things aren't gonna be the way they were exactly in that series, and it also serves as a little bit of a red herring moment. It's kinda getting one over on the movie's audience, as even people who haven't read The Long Halloween or don't know anything about it probably have an existing knowledge of Harvey Dent, and know that a gruesome transformation is pretty much inevitable. The fact that there's a scene that focuses on the reveal of Harvey's unaffected face, yeah, I think it's safe to say that they knew what they were doing. This was the movie's way of telling us, relax, we're not there yet. Things aren't gonna happen the way you think they're gonna happen. But hey, don't worry, outside of this Two-Face tease, there's still a lot of other references alluding to Harvey's future. They're not exactly hiding them. Another big change is having Catwoman know Bruce's dual identity. And I have some comments on this one. This wasn't the worst thing to do. It's personally not a route that I would have taken, what with Batman being in his early years especially, but I guess it's okay that they did. To me, and again, this is just my own brain here, no one, this is not set in stone anywhere, but to me, that kind of reveal should come maybe seven years to a decade after they started playing that whole cat bat mouse game. It's just different to see the two acknowledge each other by name in and out of costume. I don't hate it, 
but I also don't love it. Not something I would have done personally, interesting to see nonetheless. Poison Ivy shows up for a stinger at the end, and while she was present in the original telling of the tale, her inclusion and intention wasn't revealed so early on in the story. Will this change anything? I don't know! I don't know, probably not, but part of me wonders if they changed Poison Ivy's entrance into the story for the sole fact that they wanted people to get more excited for part two. Like, it feels like her whole placement in this version of events was solely to get people invested in the second part of it. They didn't want to risk her disguising herself as someone else and end on a nonsense note to hype part two. The characters also seem a lot more fleshed out than they were in the book. The bad guys are still bad guys, but they don't seem like just bad guys. They seem like guys who are bad. You guys hear that last sentence? I'm paid to speak for a living, and then I come out with some dumb shit like that. I think the movie makes the characters very three-dimensional, despite the fact that physically they clearly are not. I'm sure there's a lot of differences I probably missed, but I genuinely have very little recollection of the book. And again, didn't read it all the way through. I will, but I have not yet. The movie also has an interesting animation style. The thick dark lines that outline the characters, mixed in with how the backgrounds are drawn, really gives the movie that same feel of the graphic novel. Or, well, at least like a graphic novel, not necessarily the one this is based off of. Because while this is an adaptation of the story, it doesn't often borrow the same visuals from that specific book. The art style here couldn't be any more different, but I kinda think that that might be for the better. The art from the Long Halloween comics was bizarre in the best ways. It was unsettling and the character designs are enough to put anyone outside their comfort zone. It really adds to that uh, grimy, slimy feeling that Gotham City has. This style works great for the story that they were telling and for the medium that they were telling it in. See, from panel to panel, this really helps emulate just how unsafe Gotham City is. The characters in the book look shady at best, in more ways than one. But I don't know if that would translate quite as well in moving pictures. So this change, to me at least, is definitely a most welcome one. The movie's style somewhat emulates what the panels of a comic book would look like. And yeah, sure, it looks like Diet Archer, but I personally like it. I understand if it's not for everyone, but works for me. In terms of character design, I like almost all of them. Batman looks good, Catwoman looks good, Calendar Man will haunt my nightmares and the nightmares of my offspring for generations to come. I'm not too crazy about Joker's yee yee ass haircut, but he's fine otherwise. I liked all of them. Everyone except for all of the character cameos in Arkham Asylum. I find myself hating the brief sight of all of these characters. Which sucks, because if I remember the story correctly, and they're following that format, we're gonna be seeing a whole lot of them very soon. And I just straight up do not want to. I do not approve. Once the Penguin, the Scarecrow, and the Mad Hatter to all look exactly alike, I don't. I don't know who asked for that, but it certainly wasn't me. This is something I need to say, the sound mixing here, and, and mind you, it's coming from me. You guys have heard some of my videos in the past, not always that great, but the sound mixing is really, really bad at times. In one scene, there's a rainstorm overpowering the characters' voices and making some of the lines completely inaudible. Thank God for subtitles, because I would have had no idea what the fuck was going on. Also, that same storm appears to be raging by how it's drawn. It sounds like it's just a light sun shower with the volume adjusted all the way to 11. I'm not really the type to pick these things up, and if I do, I'm mostly unfazed, but here, yeah, I don't know, man. You guys, you guys didn't proof check this. You just, you just put it out. You're like, hey, screw this. We got to get to part two. I don't know, with, with the rain overpowering every other sound, I was getting some real Demon Hunter flashbacks. And that's a place I don't ever want to be. One of my biggest complaints is the fact that the movie seems to end seemingly out of nowhere. And that might be because WB decided to take a graphic novel and split it right down the middle. Clearly symbolic of one of the story's main characters. It doesn't seem like splitting the movie in half was a necessity. The runtime of part one is under an hour and a half, and having it end the way that it did felt entirely unnatural. 
it didn't make a whole lot of sense narrative wise. There's no, there's no cliffhanger conclusion. There's just events followed by credits. I don't know, just the death of Alberto Falcone really isn't that big of a deal when we've only had three scenes with the guy, and one of them he was in the background, and the other two he was sniveling. Though, like I said before, there's a pretty dope after the credits stinger that does actually manage to get me hyped for part two. The problem is, I would have been hyped for the next act in this movie, too, so... You know, what did you really accomplish there? We've got to have money. I don't know, splitting the story in half just seemed really unneeded. Maybe Warner Brothers just started to break out in a sweat when they read the title The Long Halloween. I don't know. Another thing that absolutely needs to be commented on is how good the voice acting is here. The cast all around are fantastic in the roles that they're given. You got Jensen Ackles, who had a small part to play in Smallville and voiced Jason Todd in Under the Red Hood, coming in to play Batman for the first time ever. Not the first time he auditioned, because he was once a dark horse in the running for the Dark Knight in Batman Begins. Jensen plays Batman for the first time to near perfection. There were plenty of times in this movie that I completely forgot that he was cast in the role. He manages to mostly lose himself in it. There's a couple times where he slips back into his normal voice just a little bit, but those times are far and few between. And I found myself really enjoying him as Batman. I did have some reservations at first, only because I thought he sounded much more youthful. To me, when he was cast as Jason Todd, I thought, yeah, that makes sense. But hearing that he was playing Batman, I was like, oh, please be good. Please be good. And then he gives me this performance where he's not good. He's great. You got Win a Day with Chad Hamilton playing Harvey Dent. And throughout the performance and the way that the movie chooses to portray Harvey, you get a really good sense of this character's dual identity. I honestly would have to rank him as one of my favorite Two-Face performances. He comes across as the confident, charming, prominent district attorney, as well as a troubled man battling his own demons in secrecy. There's subtlety to the way the movie alludes to his identity disorder. He doesn't just drastically shift between two contrasting extremes, but instead facial reactions such as small smirks and furrowed brows, as well as a slight change in his voice, are examples of a switch in his personality. Again, really well done. And I wouldn't be surprised if someone who knew nothing about Batman watched this and all of these micro actions just went entirely over their head. It wasn't in your face, it was kind of just lurking beneath. This is also the last performance by Naya Rivera. And I'm not going to sit here and act like I knew her work up until this, because I'm really unfamiliar. Maybe she was in a bunch of things, but for me, I only knew her from this one specific role. And man, what a way to go out, because she stands out as a highlight of this movie. I don't know how much of her was recorded, I don't know if she'll be in part two, but to me, this video would feel really incomplete if I didn't, if I didn't sit down and give this woman her due. She did a really good job when exploring Catwoman's flirtatious side, but she also gave a very human performance here. You know, I see her both as a, as a Catwoman and as a woman, and, and that, that's, that's what you want. The movie even ends with a tribute to her. I have more to say about this performance, but there's still a part two to this, so I'm gonna wait until that comes out. There's a bunch of little things that I appreciate about The Long Halloween as well, such as the opening title acting as an homage to John Carpenter's Halloween. I like the new reasoning they gave to Harvey's coin obsession. I enjoyed the interactions between Batman and Catwoman, who perfectly bounced off each other, and had great chemistry, as well as a compelling dynamic. Calendar Man's cameo was cringingly creepy, and he was played by, oh, of course, the John Glover of our time. I don't think it was an intentional reference to The Dark Knight, but I could definitely see some parallels in this one scene in The Long Halloween and this scene in The Dark Knight. The inclusion of little Barbara Gordon was good for world building, didn't take anything away from the story, if anything added a little easter egg that bat nerds like me are gonna comment on. Honestly, the list goes on. I can name probably about another 10 to 15 other minuscule things that really don't have a great effect on anything, but are just things that I appreciate. There's so much to like about this movie. So the question becomes, overall, do I think this movie is worth a watch? To which I say, absolutely. At this point in time, I'm pretty sure that this is in my top five Batman movies. And if it's not, then it only just didn't make the cut. I highly recommend this. 
It's a mostly well put together story with some of the best characters in all of the Batman mythos. And once again, it has some great performances. Happy holiday. Ackles, by the way. Ackles. The guy's name is Jensen Ackles. I made a mistake, all right? Is, is, that, is that what you wanted to hear? Is that, is that what you wanted? There you go. You got it. Do you know what my people call this past year? The Long Halloween. Listen, I know I'm a little bit late with this video. We're a little bit past the movie's release date, and we're a little bit past the holiday that's associated with the movie. So if you're unsubscribing, I get it. I said before that Part 1 is one of my all-time favorite Batman movies. It was really well done. I liked the animation, I enjoyed the performances, I thought it was well paced, I loved the plot, I was a fan of the detective element of the movie, and the dialogue was really, really good. But now the question is, how does part two fare in comparison? Well, let's find out. What I love about this movie is that the narrative unfolds in a very natural way. A lot of the time with stories, there are a few plot points here and there that aren't given a lot of or sometimes any attention. But not so here. One action is always leading into the next, and we get to see the story unfold from multiple characters' perspectives. We're not just following Bruce and Batman. We get plenty of time with Harvey, with the Falcones, and with the Moronis. The characters mostly integral to the plot are given a proper amount of screen time, and throughout their screen time we're shown their motivations. We understand who all these people are, and while that does sound simple, let's not brush that off. Because there is a lot going on in this movie. There's so many plot threads, but they're all weaving together perfectly. Unlike my sentences. Here you have Batman solving his first big investigation. It seems like this is the first time he has to be more than just a skilled fighter. And while we all know him as the world's greatest detective, it's clear that this takes place in a time before then. You may be aces in a fist fight, but you've got a lot to learn about detective work. So you got Batman being a detective, you have the fall of the Moroni and Falcone families, you got the come up of the Holiday Killer, a full-blown origin story of Two-Face following Harvey trying to take down the mob. These are all not just plot points, but plots in of themselves in this movie. Not to mention that it's reveal after reveal after reveal. I mean, this part, as well as the first one, the whole premise of this is building up to one big reveal but it's setting up and solving smaller ones along the way. This two-parter sets up the world of Gotham City, showing us every intricate relationship and the connections these characters have to one another. If you're a fan of world-building and whodunits, then Batman The Long Halloween is the two-part adventure for you. The movie picks up where the last one leaves off, having Bruce under Ivy's control. Poison Ivy, of course, working with Falcone, basically forces Bruce Wayne into funding the mob. His manner is basically turned into compost, and while he hasn't of late had good housekeeping, at least he has a housebroken loyal cat who comes in to save the day. If that sounded like misogyny, it wasn't. It was just a desperate attempt at wordplay and trying to sound clever. Which, now that I've said that out loud, might be worse. I'm sorry. I failed you. Catwoman luckily brings him back down to his senses to end the stinger from the last movie and begin the plot of this one. There's a scene where Scarecrow injects not gases, but injects Batman with his fear toxin, which has an interesting effect on the Dark Knight. You see, Batman isn't haunted by nightmares and what-ifs, but instead by visions of the past and what was. Namely, the murder of his parents. Of course! The sheer confusion and disorientation from basically being roofied reduces Bruce to a scared child calling out for his parents. Literally. This further humanizes the character and shows that despite his best efforts, he's not some invulnerable symbol of justice. He's a man with his own weaknesses. The movie manages to properly portray the man underneath the mask. But they also don't neglect to focus on the facade of Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne is still a very different man to the public than he is in private. The image he upholds is that of a snarky ladies' man and a functional alcoholic with a carefree attitude. And it's done perfectly. Mr. Wayne, uh, it's Bruce. Can I get you anything? Alfred makes a terrific Mai Tai. It's 8.30 in the mo- No. The young lady I went to meet. I don't think her husband likes me very much. That's very convenient. Well, not for her husband. 
Not every iteration of the Caped Crusader includes this development, so I really appreciate the ones that do, because this is one of my favorite elements of the Bruce Wayne Batman character. When every other hero puts on a costume, it's their persona. But when Bruce Wayne puts on bat ears, that's the real deal right there. Because Batman isn't a persona, Bruce Wayne is the persona he puts on. We're also shown that there's a lot more to the Falcone character. Yes, he's a mob boss, but he doesn't hold the power that he once did. Now he's constantly questioned by those who work underneath him. We're shown a man who is afraid of the perception of his cohorts. He makes rash decisions that impact his relationship with everyone, his children included. Not only does he go outside the family and link up with deranged psychopaths, which I don't know if you know, but that was still frowned upon in the Gotham criminal underworld. It was in poor taste. But also not giving his daughter a seat at the table for the fear of looking like he's setting up a successor. He's not the man with the plan that he seems to be. The crime world he once helped build is now changing and passing him by. And he's smart enough to know that, but he's not intelligent enough to figure out how to change with it. The guy is stuck in neutral. Gotham's criminal underworld is being invaded by Arkham inmates with tragic origin stories. Having an accent and wearing a suit is now passe. Not to mention the guy is being tracked down and stalked by the Holiday Killer, who is surprisingly not Calendar Man. Killing people on significant dates, I, I don't know, it just it kind of seemed like it was his thing. This has got to be like the time the Riddler found out about the Clue Master. Or the Puzzler. The movie gives us the history of the Waynes and the Falcones, which I think adds another layer to the story and brings more to the lore this movie is establishing. The only thing is, is that they really don't do a whole lot with it. It's there, it's a plot point, but it doesn't, it doesn't serve any real purpose. Nothing is changed by that. For the most part, there's no information or development to come from that. The movie also seems to rule out the ambiguity of Catwoman. There's no longer this mystery that's present in a lot of other Catwoman outings of whose side is she on. Here, she's much more, uh, blatantly good. Which I have mixed feelings about. Considering that this is earlier on in Batman's vigilante career, I would think this kind of trust and opening up between her and Bruce and a full-on turn to the light side come much later on. That seems like a development that would be somewhere down the line, from my perspective at least. I don't hate it, it's just not my preference. I really love the performance Chad Hamilton gave as Harvey Dent in the last movie, and I really, really love the one that he gives here in his turn to Two-Face. I'll even say, it ranks somewhere in my top two of Two-Face performances. It's that good. He never comes off as a full-fledged villain, and I think that's why I like it so much. This interpretation of the Two-Face character seems to be a lot closer to what someone with dissociative identity disorder would go through. I'm not saying it's spot on by any means, I'm just saying it's a lot closer than other versions of the character have made it out to be. His alternate personality only comes to the surface when Harvey is feeling weak, vulnerable, or significantly stressed. And it's also been present prior to his facial scarring, which is important. I don't like the tellings of the tale where that just happens because Harvey's got two faces now. Even in his most dastardly deeds, we still see the humanity in Harvey throughout. When he realizes just who the Holiday Killer is, he goes out of his way to defend them attacking his friends and colleagues, Batman and Commissioner Gordon. He even winds up taking responsibility for atrocities he clearly didn't commit, all in the name of protecting someone he loves. Harvey isn't a force of evil. He's a confused symbol of both good and bad. What I love about the character in other media is very present here. It's that constant questioning of what is right. What, is wrong? what actions should you take in doing the right thing? That unsure feeling of what is justice and what is revenge. Harvey Dent's life is a constant struggle, living to fight off his own demons until eventually calling a truce with them over a coin toss. I get all that and more from this Harvey Dent, from this Two-Face. And I just think that this version of the character fires on levels that a lot of other versions of the character do not. Don't even get me, don't even get me started with Solomon Grundy and Two-Face's interactions here. They're amazing. Grundy, a former man of limited vocabulary, somehow helps Harvey find his own path and accept his spiritual death and life-changing rebirth. 
Born on a Monday. Reborn. Resurrected. On a Monday. Born on a Monday. I would have never thought to pair these two together, but after this, I'm ready for the two to get their own buddy cop series. I would tune into it. But if I'm being honest with myself, I think that we all know that show would air on a Monday and be taken off the air on a Sunday. Man up! All right, what happened? What'd you lose him? He's a freak. He's the fastest kid alive. This is not good. He's the fastest kid alive. Fastest kid alive, my ass. Come on! I enjoy that Harvey's trick coin has a history of its own here. Initially being Falcone's before handing it off to a young Bruce Wayne, before Bruce, now as Batman, would pass it down to the once promising district attorney Harvey Dent having it eventually become the primary method of decision-making used by the infamous Two-Face. It's also the flip of this very coin that ends Falcone's life. I guess it's like they always say, live by the coin, die by the coin. This moment is one of the many cases of poetic justice or poetic tragedy that occurs in this movie. Also, shout out to them for quoting the first Batman comic. And everybody knows criminals are superstitious. Side note here, this doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I just love how Italian these names are. Oh boys, you better watch out, it's Luigi Moroni and his brothers Rigatoni Ravioli and Pasta Fangul! I know these are the characters' names in the comic too, but... Oh, it's just funny to hear out loud. Italian people, they, they have the funniest names. And before you get offended in the comments, I need you to know that I can say these types of things because my last name is Infuso. You Italian? There's a couple smaller issues I have with this movie, and also one really, really big one. For one, while it's nice to see characters such as the Scarecrow, the Mad Hatter, Poison Ivy, and the Penguin all brought into this story, they really aren't all that useful. They're just kind of there. They're present. I see them. I could definitely say that they're in this movie, but that's kind of all I could say about them. They're not a driving factor in what makes this movie work. They almost come off as fan service. Now, I know these characters are also present in the comic, but in this telling of the tale, they're not all that relevant. They're honestly just henchmen, which doesn't feel like the greatest use for these specific characters. Though I will say it is interesting to see the mob world of Gotham have a spotlight put on them, while the Looney Tunes take a back seat, because for the most part, it's almost always the other way around. There's also a whole lot of finger-pointing in this movie as to just who the man behind the Holiday Killer mask is. And I get it. Uh, that's a pretty normal thing to happen given the circumstances. In real life, if there was somebody going around murdering people, I I'm sure that a whole bunch of people would have their conspiracy theories. That makes sense in real life. But when it's put into effect in a movie or a TV show or whatever, Audiences, for the most part, have smartened up to tropes and just how things work. Most people rule out an accused party as a suspect if it's not them outright revealing themselves or if there's more than 10 minutes left in the runtime. Because so many people are accused in passing of being the Holiday Killer, we learn pretty early on all the people Holiday is not, leaving limited room for who it can actually be. Most people are already going into this thinking, which one of these characters who has a significant amount of screen time can it be? And the movie's not making it any harder by constantly narrowing the choices down. I don't like this game. I came here to see Batman, not play Guess Who. Here's the thing that gets me though. This is the big one. This, this, is, this is the one I, I dislike very much. I hate the ending of this movie. It doesn't ruin the movie for me, but it does cheapen the story just a bit. Because the whole plot is centered around the eventual, final reveal of just who the Holiday Killer is. And it is, spoiler alert, it is Gilda Dent. Harvey's wife, and as we learn later on, the ex-wife of Alberto Falcone. And boy oh boy, I, I hate it. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Though not for the reasons you may think. What I love about big reveals is that when they're done right, you can rewatch the movie or show or whatever and follow a small trail of breadcrumbs that you might not have seen before. And while there is in fact a small trail one could follow, and having her work in the background I guess is fair enough, the movie gives her plenty of motives to do so. 
being that she was married to Alberto Falcone and pregnant with his child. Carmine, upset with the son's choice to have a child out of wedlock, had their marriage annulled and the child ripped from her womb, leaving her unable to ever give birth again. Another case of poetic tragedy, as Falcone right before his death would learn that he too fathered a child out of wedlock, that being Catwoman. The character has all the reasons to be Holiday, but it is still impossible to somehow believe that she is. Why you ask? Look at her! They look completely different, absolutely no similarities, two different people. And yes, smart guy in the comments, I get that it's a disguise. I understand that she's hiding her identity. But what I'm saying is, is that they were drawn completely different. And there is no earthly way to believe that these two people are one in the same. And I'm not just saying because she's a woman or she's petite or whatever, because this can be done correctly. And I know this can be done correctly because it has been. Look at Mask of the Phantasm. Sure, the woman underneath the mask had a completely different body shape, but the Phantasm outfit was bulky and not form-fitting. There was a full head mask to cover up details like her hair and facial features. Therefore, it's completely believable that she could be this character. Holiday, on the other hand, only wears, and I, I cannot stress this enough, a hat, a bandana, and a trench coat. Now, I can get how the hat can cover up and disguise the hair. Even if the hat isn't big enough to fully cover up the back of her head, I'm willing to look past that and give them the benefit of the doubt. Suspension of disbelief. But then there's other things like the broadness of the character's shoulders or the fact that it doesn't have a bust. I have a harder time giving the movie credit here, but maybe... Perhaps I could look past that. But here's where the whole thing comes apart for me. Holiday's eyes are completely visible the entire time that they're on screen. And they look absolutely nothing like Gilda's very expressive, almost anime-styled bright blue eyes. They're different shapes and colors. These are not the same people. Gilda's eyes are like her most prominent feature. They're the only thing that sticks out about this character design, and yet... Holidays don't. They're about as plain and bland as a Hannibal interview. This bothers me in ways I cannot properly express. It somewhat takes a little bit away from my enjoyment of everything because it's kind of an important detail. I'm sure this was just done to throw viewers off the trail, but like, I don't know, slap some goggles on the guy. Girl, whatever, I'll just put some over his eyes. That's all I'm asking for, the bare minimum. Just make it make sense, that's all. That's all I want! Because of that, I have a really hard time believing these two are the same person. Even though I, obviously at this stage of life, know. Speaking of Mask of the Phantasm, if you'd like to see my take on it, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying, Happy Holiday. And look, I'm gonna be honest with y'all, I don't think Part 2 is quite as good as Part 1. But it's still pretty damn close. I enjoy this one almost as much as I enjoy the first. And combined, it has to be one of my all-time favorite Batman movies. I still think they did a really great job with the source material. The right people were working in the right jobs on this project. I think these are two great movies based on a great graphic novel. And I also think that the changes made to the original kind of enriched this more. Look, I love what I remember of the Long Halloween comic but I specifically remember it coming off a lot like Silence of the Lambs meets The Godfather, but with Batman. I like what this movie did with its source material. I am in favor of almost all of the many changes that were made. That's me personally, but I understand that some of you aren't, and that's okay. What really sucks about this is that I just, just, just said that Batman Under the Red Hood and Batman Beyond Return of the Joker were my two favorite Batman movies. And now, this just came out, and and I, I'm at a loss here, because now I have three, technically four, Batman movies at the number one spot. That is a very confused list. I will say that I question their decision on making The Long Halloween two parts when could've and probably should've just released it as one long movie. I mean, when, when I try to break this down and make it make sense, you got Injustice, which was five years of graphic novels and two video games, combined them all together to be under an hour and a half long movie. 
But The Long Halloween, which was one singular graphic novel, not, not a huge one, mind you, just an average-sized graphic novel, you took it upon yourself to split into two separate parts. I'm not judging, I'm just trying to understand. Regardless, I highly suggest checking out Batman The Long Halloween. If you haven't already, clearly you're missing out. It does not disappoint. In the end, was it worth it? He's asking if the good guys won. Yes, the good guys won. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs>